Hi, everybody. This question comes from our monthly Ask Dr. David live YouTube series. Hope you find it helpful. I saw the news in the, the news article in the Washington Post about your patient who was denied an abortion despite, not, um, despite having a baby that would not survive more than a couple hours after delivery. If, um, if, the, pregnancy, if the pregnancy goes that far, how is she doing? Thanks for asking. You know, when this came to my attention, it's a patient who I've been doing primary care for, who I was just doing an annual checkup for. And when she told me that she was pregnant, of course, my natural reaction was congratulations until the next sentence that came out to tell me about the Potter syndrome that the baby has the, um, that does not have developing kidneys, therefore does not make amniotic fluid. Therefore, not only does the baby not have the cushion inside her, inside mom in order to, um, to help the baby grow and to also cushion how it's lying inside the uterus, which is causing tremendous, tremendous amount of pain because there's not the cushion, but also amniotic fluid is essential for lung development of the tissue itself for the maturing of the tissue to have that single layer oxygen exchange between the outside world of the air and the bloodstream right on the other side of the alveoli, the air sacs that exchange the air. And not only that, but when a person has Potter syndrome and no amniotic fluid, one of the things that happens with a, a, a fetus, a, a baby, as they're getting towards the end of the pregnancy is that they start doing actual it's practice breathing. And to the, literally the opening and the, and the closing of the lungs and, 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 the, and the, the chest movements um, in order to practice for breathing. And that's something that does not develop when there's no amniotic fluid either. So for, I know I've shared this with other people, but some of these, um, some of, they don't even survive and there's a miscarriage late. Other times they will survive for maybe a couple hours, but basically without developing lungs and having no way to develop them at that point, the baby unfortunately will suffocate within a couple hours of delivery and the chances of survival is virtually nil and incredibly sad. And for those just to continue the story, um, may know that because this was discovered right around 22, 23 weeks, which was at the point of viability, which means when a baby can survive outside of the womb, and the Florida law that was recently enacted said that abortions cannot be done after 15 weeks. Now, there is an exception that says unless the life of the baby or the mother is in jeopardy. However, it says and is not and, um, and is not viable. Now, the issue here is the definition of viability. Now, in the medical terms, viability is a time, 23 weeks, plus or minus. But the viability to, of course, a human being listening to the term is not a medical diagnosis. It's a when would you survive? When would the baby be able to survive outside the uh, about that? And of course, the diagnosis would mean never. This child would never have the ability to survive. But that's not the definition that the doctors that were her OBs that were going by, her high risk doctors who had originally had advised her that she could do a termination of the pregnancy. But because she got points that age of viability and there was ambiguity in the law, the hospital decided that they would not feel comfortable going ahead with the termination procedure. Her doctors wouldn't. And it really got to be um, very unfortunate. And she wouldn't be able to do what she felt was in the best interest of her and her family, her four year old son who was expecting to have a fetus to come, a baby to come home, her husband who's having, of course, all of his emotions too. And, uh, and so as of now, the, um, she's supposed to be going later this week, um, where they're going to be doing the final scans, um, and actually checking internally to make sure that the, um, cervix is moving along, you know, at 37 weeks, which is where she's coming up on, they're allowed to induce. And that would really be just to induce, to pass the, to deliver a baby so that nature would take care of what happens next. Um, and but if the cervix isn't moving along, isn't starting to ripen yet, then there's, of course, a chance if they start to induce and the uterus is contracting, but there's no exit way, if you will, through the cervix, she would probably end up with a C-section. And that for sure is the last thing that she wants on top of everything else, not just the recovery of going through a C-section, but then, of course, there would be physical scars on her body, reminding her every day. Not that she wouldn't be reminded of this every day because of how traumatic this is, but a physical reminder, the recovery that takes place after a C-section. So it's still unclear actually when the induction will be offered. 
But that's kind of the next play. Now, you mentioned as far as this being in the Washington Post, and you know this article went completely viral. And as of yesterday, it was almost a billion. I'm assuming it's a billion now. People read this article. So not only did the Washington Post um, post it, but and, and it was in their actual print newspaper, on the front page of their website as well. But other news agencies picked up and published it as well. So over a billion people have read about this because it's the story from Chicago. It's been such a impactful story on so many people. When when I first went public with this and the outpouring of love and support that this family got everywhere from, you know, could she come to our state? We will help um, finance that. We will put her up. We will help with childcare. And I mean, again, this is how lovely it is to see that we have a community of people who care. I mean, that is truly phenomenal. Um, she did make the decision because things were close enough. And of course, not knowing exactly with her concern, could there even be legal repli- um, implications on her repercussions in the state of Florida because she terminated the baby outside and coming back? And, of course, she didn't want to have to deal with uh, any potential legal ramifications as well. And that's why the decision went forward. But also in the past um, several days, um, local reporters here in the Tampa area um, have reached out to us. We've been on um, the story has been very local as well. So you may have seen it there. And I want to thank all of the reporters who chose to cover this. It was a very brave thing to do, right, um, in order to do this. But obviously, this is a story that needed to be told. The unintended consequences. Now, I heard from a reporter today who spoke with the um, with the legislator who authored this bill who said it's obvious that vi- that this child was not viable and and she was trying to blame the doctors for it and i say if that was your intention you should have made a, a, a completely unambiguous law because when i hear viability as a physician i it means different than what she was describing as viability so i say to her and she's i think she's no longer in the legislature in florida legislature in florida i'm asking her is she going to lobby to alter the wording of this bill so that other families don't get caught up in this. This is this here is not a conversation about a woman's right to choose for abortion from everything else from 15 weeks. That's a different conversation to be had. But there are other types of conditions between besides Potter syndrome where it could be discovered in the second half of a pregnancy that is not compatible with life. Of course, people with Down syndrome 21, uh, trisomy 21, That's compatible with life. We know people can have wonderful lives, but there's trisomy 18, there's trisomy 13, again, not compatible with life. Even in my own family, my mother, um, the year prior to delivering uh, me, um, actually had a baby that was um, had birth defects due to medication that she had taken. And immediately after the baby came out, it was obvious, you know, they that the baby wasn't going to survive. And of course, they didn't have ultrasounds 55 years ago um, where they would have known this at a time. Of, and she says she certainly would have terminated if that was the case. But here was somebody who, if the if the situation was right, would she have been given that opportunity since we were in Florida. Of course, back then she would have if the technology is there. So this is also something that does hit close to our family because of the potential situation that could have happened, you know, now if the situation was happening. So thank you everybody for your support. Um, She has decided that after she delivers a baby, um, that the baby will be cremated and that they will be doing a proper funeral service. Um, And so of course, please continue to share your warm wishes and love. Um, we, I am sharing with her um, the thoughts of it. Of course, this is very difficult for her because at the same time, she's pri- this is a very private situation and a most painful situation. But at the same time, she is a warrior and says that this information needs to get out. Legislators need to know what they are doing, even as an unintended consequence. And this is patently so upsetting. That's the reason why I, when, of course, with her permission, have gone forward and been in the public eye about this. Because if we can prevent this situation from happening for other families, that would be a great thing. If you like this video, please see the description below and click the link for the full episode. And if you haven't already, Please subscribe to this channel and join us on social media.